everyone, welcome to Concert Pipeline. I'm Steve Jones. Today on the program, we have the immediate family. Uh, I had a chance to interview Wadi Walashrel and Steve Pastel of the immediate family uh, and get to dive deep into stories that they have, you know, from their many, many years, uh, not only recording together, but recording with legends. And I'm, I'm talking big legends uh, that, uh, that they were on these very notable, in, uh, incredible tracks that live, have lived forever. Uh, and, uh, and so we dove into a lot of really cool stuff and I love it. And I had uh, the whole immediate family band on uh, the program about three years ago or so toward the beginning of COVID. Uh, and uh, it just got to touch, you know, tip of the iceberg surface of stories. But these are dudes that have endless stories because they have lived such an incredible life and I mean, and gotten to be part of things that are that will outlive them uh, by uh, by a long shot. You know, music that um, you know that doesn't that won't die uh, ultimately, and that is um, incredible. So, so we're gonna get into that in just a bit, but uh, but super exciting. Um, you know, and then a note as well uh, that we talk about it in the interview, but Steve Pastel is going to be doing a, a show, uh, Our House, the music of Crosby, Crosby Stills, Nash & Young, uh, July 12th and 13th in uh, Napa, um, and uh, recommend go, uh, checking that out if you have a chance. Um, what's going on in my world? Uh, allergies are starting to kick in a little bit and it's annoying. I don't get them as bad as some people, but uh, but they're just not fun and just leaking from nose and eyes and annoyingness. I went to have dinner with, uh, um, you know, my kids at, at, at a friend's house out of town um, and brought back allergies with me. They started acting up pretty much right when I was in town with, uh, with my friend. And so I brought them back with me. So they've been hitting me the last couple of days and I, and I can take an allergy pill and uh, it won't really do anything. The only thing that really works is Benadryl. Uh, but it makes me makes me drowsy, and so I can't really take that on the norm unless, unless it's right before bed. And sometimes the allergies seem fine right before bed. So what am I supposed to do? Uh, but I did take a Benadryl this morning, uh, and uh, and then I was laying down and watching Saturday Night Live, and uh, and I passed out for another hour, and that felt good. But I woke up dry, drowsy a little bit, and I was like, what, what are we doing here? Sort of thing. Uh, it probably helped a little bit to catch up on some of the, the sleep that I'm losing. So no complaints on, on that, but, um, but that's what's going on there. Uh, next weekend, got a couple of exciting things uh, happening. My son is going to have a school carnival, which uh, I'm sure he's looking forward to going to. Uh, then I'm going to see Ben Queller uh, and uh, that will be a fun show because uh, I love some, some Ben Queller, uh, Christopher Mitch Plus. Um, more famously known as McLovin, but he's acted in a lot of uh, gr uh, other great movies as well. Kick-Ass, Kick-Ass 2, uh, something, about, there's dragon movies in there. Uh, there's, uh, there's, he's, he's been in a lot of different things, but he's in Ben Queller's band. Uh, and I had interviewed him a couple years back also with Ryan Dean. Uh, they're both in Ben Queller's band currently. And Robert Ellis uh, is going to be opening the show. He's also now in Ben Queller's band, so he's actually playing double duty uh, with two different sets at that uh, at that show. So I've interviewed pretty much everybody playing the show. Uh, don't know that I'll be doing any interviews at the show, but I'm going as a fan uh, and looking forward to it. So um, so that'll be fun. And then I'm taking my son to uh, this convention, kind of like Comic Con, called Vacacon, uh, and um, and Corey Feldman is going to be there um, uh, and. Uh, I'm currently reading his book, uh, Choreography, uh, and um, reading some of his stories because I think he's lived a pretty rough life um, and gone through a lot of shit. And I, I just, I'm always interested in people's stories. That's why I do the podcast, but I'm just always really curious because uh, everybody's got a, a story. And, uh, and so I'm interested in Corey's and might get a chance to meet him. Uh, at the convention, maybe uh, we'll uh, we'll see. I imagine I will get a chance because it's just a small little um, in town convention, but we got a you know someone with the name, so uh, we will see how that goes. Uh, I won't ramble too much more. I will uh, say that the media family has a new DVD, uh, a new uh, not DVD necessarily, although I'm sure it's on DVD, but a new documentary out 
uh, that I really recommend checking out because they brought in all of their fr uh, friends who are these legends like James Taylor and, uh, and Neil Young and uh, so many others, Billy Bob Thornton, uh, so, so many friends to tell the, the story of these guys uh, and their, their involvement in, uh, in their music. And it's a great, it's just a great story. I recommend checking it out. Um, and they also have a new album called Skin in the Game. Uh, check that out as well. Just good old fashioned rock and roll um, that uh, uh, can't go wrong with. So without further ado, let's bring in the immediate family. You hear me? We got a winner, yes. All right. I guess I had a, okay, uh, up came the uh, thing about recording. And then when I clicked that, everything worked. It should have fucking worked right away. I don't know. Should have just fucking worked right away, right? Like, what are we doing here? Are we... <laughs> yeah. How are you two gentlemen doing today? Oh, Dickie. just fine. How about you, man? Not bad. Not bad. It's great to talk to you again. Uh, I, I don't know if you remember, but I talked to you, like, I don't know, toward the beginning of the pandemic, which was 100 years ago or something at this point, and uh, a lifetime ago at least. And uh, uh, I mean, it was it was just such a fun chat to talk to you all uh, and get to hear all your stories. And I look forward to digging more into that today. Out of sight. But we're trying not to let that happen again. Can't have too much fun. <laughs> Can't have too much fun. But you know, if you're going to have fun during the pandemic, why not have it with you, uh, with you guys? Uh, that's what I. That's what I say. So. <laughs> Yeah, the good thing I didn't wear that T-shirt because I have the same Johnny Cash T-shirt. Yeah, I mean, you, we could all support the Johnny Cash shirt. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. That's I, almost, I almost wear a Merle Haggard shirt. <laughs> really? Country Idol Day. Ah, uh, yes, that's the time. Uh, so, uh, well, we have we have a lot to dig into. Uh, um, I mean. The documentary, I guess I'll, I'll start there a, a little bit. The documentary is amazing. Um, it's so enjoyable. And it's I know it's like a drop in the bucket of uh, your experiences, both as a, a group and uh, and that you have got to experience with legends, um, you know, that, and your your impact on the music world. So uh, to, let me just ask a high level uh, question, like tell me how the documentary came together. You want to take that, Steve? Sure. Um, well, it goes back. By the way, just a little, a little pitch. Uh, starting today, it streams on Hulu. So, oh, yes. that's new today. Uh, if I, if my memory is is, and correct me if I'm wrong. Well, you know, we're old. So, but uh, our our great late friend and publicist uh, Lisa Roy uh, was talking to Denny and Greg Richling, who were working on a film that wasn't coming together necessarily and Lisa suggested hey why don't you do a film on this the immediate family and they called Danny who was Lisa's partner and they had a by the end of the, their meeting uh, it was a done deal that easy huh and it, then you just started calling everybody up and getting you know getting them to well, share it, their stories yeah I mean yeah. It, for for Danny it was an obvious it was it was it was like the light bulb went off oh this is the next film after the wrecking crew so yeah, it was the next logical step for him. He realized as soon as Lisa brought it to him, he went, oh, of course, this is what I should do. And uh, and they had no roadblocks at all getting these amazing people that we've had the pleasure to work with to say, oh, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to be in that. I'll be happy to be in that. This is, I think that started pre-pandemic or right in the crest of it. Crest, yeah. I, it was in it, right? Well, but they, you know, like Carol and Peter and Jackson and all, all those guys, they were pretty early on board. They, everyone and Billy Bob, everybody just was so positive about it. It was amazing to, to witness. There was yeah. one, one funny story about that. The only person who said no was the first person we asked. Then he told me about the movie I called Crosby and he, David Crosby, he goes, well, you know, my documentary just came out. It, Will everyone hate me if I say no? And I said, no, dude, you know, it's fine. Mm -hmm. So then flash forward, the movie's almost done. Everyone said yes. And I was like, and I realized, you know, if I don't, uh, <laughs> hello, buddy. Hello. Oh. I don't, uh, if Crosby, I better ask him again. I said, Denny, we got to ask him because he'll forget that he said no. And then he'll see all his friends. <laughs> so 
he totally forgot that he said no and then i asked him and i said hey you want to want to be in the interview and james is in and carol you go, of course i do and to, next day we were up at his house so that <laughs> he, he didn't even remember that's that's beautiful and, and it's so so lucky you did i mean like not having him as a part of that would have been I mean, this big chunk that's that's missing. I mean, I want to talk to you about David David Crosby, but some of the things that I mean that I liked. I mean, about the documentary in particular. Like, I mean, he he talked about Leland. Uh, he said when uh, when he was playing with Phil Collins, he was the best player there was. Uh, I mean, he he had such I mean such great quotes that brought you know some really elevated that documentary just by his uh, his being a part of it. So I'm glad he was able to. And Wadi, wasn't he one of the first people you met in LA? Like, Well, I was gonna say, David is the same for me and Russ and Danny. And uh, he was like, when I moved here, within maybe three to four days of living in Los Angeles, and before I moved out here, I was thinking, there's two people I'd really like to meet out there. There's Brian Wilson, of course. And, uh, and at that time, Crosby was very outspoken about shit you know very politically and 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 morally really saying good things and stuff so i said i really want to meet brian but i'd love to meet david crosby too man it'd be great and within three or four days i'm sitting at a restaurant and there's david crosby sitting there and yeah. I just, my mind was like tearing it to pieces going i don't believe this is happening this would never happen on you know east 58th street in, in new york city but here we yeah. are you know uh yeah. But he touched Russell's life early like that, and Dan. He touched life. my life early. <laughs> I met him early. Uh, this is me and David Crosby uh, in like '94. <laughs> yeah, '84. So, uh, like '90, '94 or something. So. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm talking 1968. <laughs> yeah, I mean early in my life anyway. So I was a little small. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's great. Was that an airport or was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I might have been in an airport, and I, I, I didn't know who he was, but my mom did, and uh, and was like, uh, go, go say hi. And, you know, she did the go say hi and stand, stand next to him thing. And he, he was either yeah. the first first celebrity I met, or, was, or my mom did that same thing with Michael Jordan when we saw him at an arcade and uh, like uh, at the uh, family theme park or whatever. And uh, I got a picture with him. So uh, the young days. <laughs> That was, but, that, by the way, that guest appearance, that was my cat, Fuzili. Oh, Fuzili, nice, <laughs> nice. She's named that because her tail, we don't know how we rescued her, and her tail got cut off, but it looks like a little Fuzili noodle. So, and that's the name she came with. So uh, that was Fuzili, <laughs> just had to make a guest appearance there. <laughs> it's, it's, it seems fitting, it seems fitting. So, um, and, and Steve, so you, uh, you, I did guitar on, on Crosby's last solo album, uh, Sky Trails. You know, I mean, tell me kind of about that experience, um, Damien and Dan. Well, it was a fun, it was a funny experience because uh, I mean, I've known him for not nearly as long as Waddy, but I met him in '96 or '97 when <laughs> they were in uh, in the city in New York, and they needed a place to write for the band CPR, and and they called me and said, "Hey, is your studio open?" And said, hey, "But." Uh, the, the the first time I played on the record was, was so James Raymond, his son, is a is his producer and co-writer, and James is a very uh, accomplished pianist. So James writes these these has a guitar sample, and he writes these guitar parts that are completely unplayable. <laughs> so he wrote this beautiful guitar part. You know, he's playing on keyboard, so it's not. And and they said, well, the only guy who could play this is Steve. So I had to. I had to play it in three different tunings, three different sections to 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 accommodate. Uh, but it, so it was very challenging. I wrote it out like a classical, like note for note, and um, and 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 then and then of course we wrote a song for the last rock record, which also played on, and that was just a, you know it's a great experience. Yeah, and uh, and so you mentioned um, James Taylor, uh, not James Taylor. I'm sorry, uh, James Raymond. Uh, and well, we'll talk about James Taylor supper, but um, you're uh, you're actually going to be playing a show with uh, with James Raymond and a, a bunch of others, a couple of shows in in Napa, um, our house. Tell me kind of about uh, about that and what you what you have planned for that tied to you know the music of Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. Uh, yeah, the, well, to try to make a long story short. Uh, David 
um, asked me to learn his guitar parts because his hands weren't that functional anymore and I did and we put a band together and they were book, booking a tour uh, it was a great band and I was he was just going to sing and I was playing all those tunings and he showed taught me all that stuff and uh, we were on the phone on a Tuesday night and I think we should add a second night to the first show because we're the recording trucks coming in he was all excited and the next day he took a nap and didn't wake up so so it was a very aside from losing a friend and a losing a icon it was just very dramatic to lose someone that I was on the phone with the night before talking about this show so about eight months later we decided to kind of play a tribute play the concert we were going to play with guests and we had Sean Colvin and Colin Hay and Richard Page and Chris Stills and and Nathan McEwen and and we did this with the same band and we did the show and that it was such a success that we got a lot of offers to an interest in in continuing it and James and I thought we'd give it a shot one of the promoters put a tour together this summer just as short just like four weeks but to see how it goes and you know I'm I'm a, as a beautiful band everybody in the band played with had some connection like Neil Young sisters in it and and the, the guys from CSA you know all the CPR and C so it's sort of a family and friends kind of thing. And um, it's just, you know, so I'm excited about his incredible music. And we have this wonderful guy, Chris Pierce, who's going to be the other singer who's got, who opened for Neil Young last year. So it's just something that it's just fun, something nice to look forward to. Yeah, yeah. And in, in, in Napa, too. Have you have you been to Napa? Have you played shows in Napa before? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a it's a good venue. It, uh, it's it's pretty cool. I've seen a good amount of shows there, and hope to hope to catch you at one of those shows. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So um, I did I did I mentioned James Taylor, but um, you also mixed uh, James Taylor and Carol King's uh, live concert vo uh, film, the Troubadour Reunion Tour. Tell me kind of about your involvement in, in that process. Well, we just did we did mostly the vocals. Pretty much some of the some guitar stuff. It was, it was Danny, you know, Danny's, Danny's the, the conduit there. But we do a lot of work here at the studio, and Danny got the call to to isolate the vocals and fix them and mix them and and choose the right ones and you know basically go through the all the concert footage and and get the right vocals in there and, and some of the guitar stuff. And so uh, it took about three months working every day it was because they had wow. months of, of you know they they recorded the whole tour so but it came out great i actually never saw it i saw it last it was on last week and it came out great that was great yeah that's that's really cool and uh, and so uh wadi back to some immediate family stuff you met uh cooch uh, uh kind of through tim curry uh, uh album that, that was being done can you tell me about that yeah, it was a, it was a, Lou Adler hired me to come play for Tim's record, and uh, and I had already played with Leland and Russell, but I hadn't yet met Danny, and sure enough, this guy whose name and credibility I kept questioning because I'd see it on the back of albums and go, why is this guy getting all that work? Um, I showed up to the date and there was Danny. And we met, we were, we became brothers like immediately, really. Um, so immediate family, again, th that's the right name because it was always meant to be, I think. And uh, we related instantly. And this first song that they chose was a reggae tune. And right at that time, uh, that movie, The Heart of They Come had just come out. So myself and my team, which was myself, Zivon, uh, and our brother, Jorge Calderon, we were out of our minds over that record and Danny with whoever he was listening to stuff with, they were doing the same thing. So we knew exactly <laughs> the kind of music we were going to play and, and we didn't get in each other's way ever, uh, just approaching a song. We'd always be in a different part of the neck than the other guy. And it's, it's been like that forever, really. You know, sonically yeah. we're very different and uh, sonically, melodically, <laughs> all kinds of ways. It's a it's a great combination 
of opposing styles, really. Unless you get down to the rhythm part where we're both monsters about playing rhythm and very picky about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, tell, tell me about Stevie Nicks and kind of getting to work with her, her style and kind of the relationship that you, you built with her. Because, I mean, yeah, you started like with Buckingham Nicks and then kind of, I mean, you did a lot of her stuff too. And Edge of 17 on its own, I, I mean, I want to ask about that too, but just t- let's start with just Stevie well, as a whole. Keith Olson, the late great producer, dear friend of mine and, and Stevie's and Lindsay's, uh, I was working, with, matter of fact, my first session with Leland was for Keith. Uh, we did a Bobby Womack record and uh, I was working with Keith on my own material and he was hiring me to do sessions. And all of a sudden he said to me, I'm bringing this couple down from Northern California and you got to play with them. He says, you're going to really like them. They're great singers really good writers and uh but the guy he played he works so much alone he doesn't really know how to play with any, anyone else so i want you to you know get in there with him and get two guitars going so i said okay and they came down and we all you know got along right away and stevie was <laughs> she was as clean as a, a whistle that girl was you know she didn't smoke she didn't drink she didn't do anything wrong till much later and uh so and she you know i could hear them right away that what they were doing it was great stuff the, the uh, on that Brookingham Nicks album the 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 material is great you know and the, the vocals are beautiful and so we just spent a lot of time together i mean stevie i've known her longer than i've known russ and lee and everyone else wow. <laughs> you know the uh the session i did for Bobby Womack came later than the uh, Buckingham Nick stuff. At that point, it was just, it was unbelievable. It was like 1970, 71, at the, I think the beginning of 71 and the end of 1970. And it was uh, extraordinary. And then we parted company for quite a while. They went off with Fleetwood. I was out with Linda. I was out with, uh, when I first met him, I was still playing with the Everly Brothers. So that was a, that was a wild time because when I left, uh, they and Lindsay needed a job and they needed a guitar player. So I got, <laughs> I brought him over to Don Everly's and said, here, have this guy, you know, try this guy. So Lindsay played with him for a little while. So and, you're responsible for that. Yeah, that's cool. What? You're responsible for Lindsay. Huh? That's cool. Well, with the Everly's anyway. I mean. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, and, um, and then, so I didn't see them for a while, you know, and I sat, I was with them a lot during the Fleetwood recordings just hanging out at the studio with him. And I played on uh, Sugar Daddy, one of the songs on that first album. And then we all went out on the road for quite a while. Didn't see them. And I got a call from uh, Jimmy Iovine's office saying, we want you to come play on Stevie's solo album. I went, oh, fantastic. And it was like, I think it was probably the third session of the day. Um, And I think I'd already spent the morning with Russell somewhere else. And we wound up at Studio 55, and there was Stevie, and we hadn't seen each other. I saw her once. Um, There was a movie called FM, if you remember this movie. And uh, Linda Ronstadt, we were, Linda was in the movie, and uh, they filmed some of our concert footage in in Houston and put it in this film. So uh, there was a, a premiere of it. And I, one of my dear friends in life is uh, John David Souther, J.D. Souther. And uh, we spent a lot, a lot of years together. And we were going to go to this movie. We were going to go to this premiere. He says, oh, great. He says, my date's going to be Stevie Nicks. I went, what? you got to be kidding me. <laughs> really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, so I went to J.D.'s house. And the Steve, there Stevie comes in. And she's smoking cigarettes. She's having a drink, and I'm going, okay. Not the same Stevie you knew her before. <laughs> Not exactly the same. Not exactly the same. I mean, I was like, you know, I had a... <laughs> yeah, yeah, pick your job up before a little bit. <laughs> uh, whoa, we've changed a little, huh? But, uh, and, you know, and I always feel people don't really change anyway, but she, she learned other avenues of uh, existence, let's put it that way. And, uh, but then, so I went to the studio and we got there to do her solo album. And 
I can't remember what song we did first and, and, and what sequence things happened, but when Edge came about, it was an extraordinary evening all about. I mean, the other songs were, went down great too. Belladonna, really a confusing piece of music that is. And uh, it, it came out, I don't even know how that worked out really. It's really confusing. Uh, <laughs> but uh, when Edge of 17 came out, they brought us in the booth to hear her demo of it. And Stevie loves to, she'll hear something that someone's doing and it'll spark an idea of hers. So she'll, you know, write to that, not, not steal the changes and not steal the, the song at soul. It's just the mood and the feeling of it. So Edge of 17 was based on uh, one of the police songs, whatever song it is that has that ticket, 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 ticket. But but Andy's doing it with echoes, you know, he's doing it with an echoplex. And so I came in the booth and I heard the demo and and her vocal, the, the, what she's singing is like, wow, where did that come from? Yeah. Yeah, that's some serious yeah. rock and roll singing. And, uh, but the uh, track, Jimmy said, so I want you to do that thing, like, you know, like with the echo. I said, well, I'm not going to do that. He goes, what? And I said, I, I don't use echoes like that. I don't, I, I'll just do it. He goes, what do you mean you'll just do it? And I said, well, come here. And we went out to my Marshall and I just picked up the guitar and said, I'm going to do this. And he went, oh, wow, okay. And, uh, and then so everybody got in their positions and Stevie went out to that vocal booth and sang the shit out of that fucking song. And, and we nailed it. It was an unbelievable session. Unbelievable. Yeah. Did you, do you have any idea at that time? Yeah, I mean, you know, you say you nailed it. Do you know at that time, okay, this is a hit. Do you ever have that feeling? Because you've been on... You know, uh, I, I, I do get that feeling. With, with that song, it was so abstract and different. I didn't know. I wasn't sure. But I knew it was amazing and stronger than anything. But I, I didn't, you know, I, I've, I've... There's a couple of songs that I've done with people in the studio where I'm going... That's a smash. Yeah. I can name them for you, too. Uh, but uh, with Edge, I was just blown away, first of all, that we got through it. It was it's a real challenging piece of drumming on that that Russell had to do with that upbeat on the kick drum and then transitioning through the sections and back to it. And it was quite a feat. So it, yeah. we were. I was really proud of it and amazed by that we got it done. And it was and her vocal was astounding. <laughs> It's so funny. To, sometimes we'll be on the road and she'll say, I sound hoarse. I sound hoarse. Don't I sound hoarse? I'm going, sound hoarse. Huh? I don't know. Did you ever hear a song called Edge of 17 by Stevie Nicks? Uh, she sounds a little hoarse on that, you know. A little bit, yeah. A little, little, rough, little rough patch of vocal there, don't you think? She goes, yeah, maybe. But... <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's awesome. And... What I love from the, from the documentary also, I mean, you, you talk about werewolves of London. Uh, like you played that song like endlessly overnight uh, and like so many takes of that song and then went back to like the, the second take or something, right? Yeah. Like, and, yeah. and, and it was like, that's the right one. Tell me, like, what was that experience? Did, did, you, did you feel like, okay, at the time, it, I think it was the second one that was the right one, or you just yeah, like, we're gonna. We got, you know, we were so happy to get Mick and John to come play with us. Because I, I don't know if you know the build up to it, but we tried it with every band in town. I mean, every drummer yeah. I know, every drummer, every bass player, different bass player with that drummer, different drummer with that bass player, all the greatest guys in town. We tried, and it just never, for Warren and I, it didn't feel heavy. It It, it always felt light and, and comedic and Warren and Jackson would go, well, that sounds really good. And we're both going, no, man, no, no, no. It doesn't say, it sounds funny. It doesn't, if the track is light, it's not going to work. We need the track to sound like serious so the jokes can work, you know? And, uh, and Jorge, I think it was Jorge Calderon, I'm pretty sure. Jorge suggested Mick and John Fleetwood's. And I went, oh, now those guys could lay this down. Those guys got heavy hands, you know, and Nick has got that strong beat. So they were blown away that we were asking them to come play with us. And I was blown away that they were blown away. <laughs> I said, are you kidding? 
well, why don't you just get over here? Let's uh, do this. So they came over and we, we did a take and, and it was great. I'm standing on this, here's a drum platform and here's the drums right here. And I'm standing on that platform next to Mick and he's just blasting away. I got headphones on, thank God. <laughs> and, and, and it was a small studio, the sound factory it was a really small little joint. So you had the, the drums and me on this one riser facing the piano, which was right in front of us with a bunch of padding on it. And John McVie was over there in between Warren and Mick, right? Like, here's, here's the piano, here's John, here's Mick, and here's me, four of us. We did a take, it wasn't bad. I mean, you know, three chords. <laughs> so there's not that much to learn in it. And uh, so then we did the second take and got through it. And Jackson just went, why, wow, that was pretty good. I went, oh, yeah? He goes, yeah, you want to hear it? And Mick Fleetwood goes, no, 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 let, let's keep going. Let's just keep going, man. Keep going. You didn't even stop to listen to it. Yeah. Never listened. Never listened. So hours later, <laughs> and literally hours later, it takes 60 or something, I said to Jackson, I said, so, because Mick was going, we're never done, Waddy. We're never done. I said, I, I, we're in the 50s of takes. I'm going, I'm getting tired here, man. You know, uh, I think we're done. He goes, we're never done. I said, oh, we're never done. Okay, keep going. Here goes another one. And finally, we got into take 60, I think it was. And, and I just went, all right, hold it. Jackson, he said take two was pretty good. He goes, yeah, I thought, you want to hear it? I went, yes. Sorry, Mick. Now, we're going to go listen. That was a good time. <laughs> and we went in and listened, and I went, Mick, we're done. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> there's a part where you're, you're like you know you're doing part of something special special something magical but then there's another moment where you're like okay my fingers are going to fall off at this point or like <laughs> it wasn't even that it was just like why are we <laughs> yeah. three chords we must have this you know yeah. uh, then, let's do another do another do another okay okay and we, like I said we were so blown away that Fleetwood Mac wanted to come work with us so you know, anything, being good hosts, <laughs> okay, we'll keep going, fine. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Uh, Steve, question for uh, for you. Talk to me about the, uh, the Neil Young Rascals. Uh, you uh, you played a show last year, I think, in Studio City with, uh, and uh, um, T-Bear was a part of that as well, and I'm talking to T-Bear uh, tomorrow, so I'm kind of curious about that dynamic and working with uh, T-Bear. Which, which show? I, I did a was it. Stephen Stills and Neil Young at the Greek, but I don't think- Was I it was... at the Greek? Yeah. Okay, okay was, think... T -Bear, was T Bear a part of that? I thought I saw something where- okay. no. no, I got to, originally I was asked to play just the one, we had a version of um, of Wooden Ships and we, had been, we, we knew it. So they asked me and James and Chris Stills to come play that with Stephen. And it was just one of those funny things. I'm sure Whitey's had this experience when I'm there, and and uh, you know, next thing I know, um, I get uh, Joe Walsh comes up to me and says, "Hey, uh, can you play on my two tunes?" I said, yeah, "Sure." And then uh, Chris Stills, "Can you play on this?" And then Neil Young or Stephen, "Can you play on Bluebird with me and Neil?" And so I ended up playing like a whole bunch of. I was really went there to play one song, but it was it was a, it's their. Uh, uh, Light up the blues for autism charity that mm. Steve and White do. Uh, it was fantastic. And then at the end, uh, uh, Lucas and um, played and his dad, you know, uh, so Willie Nelson ended. I think closed the show. It was it was a nice affair. Oh, that's great. Willie and Lucas was there too. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's great. It was funny because I wasn't originally playing Bluebird, so I I ran in the back. I'm like, yeah, you don't even know it. <laughs> like, I've heard it, but I'm like, you know, it's not that hard, but it's, it's but it's, everything a, it. it's a modal D thing, and then you got to know where the C comes and where the G comes. So I get up on stage and I'm right next to Neil, and Neil plays at the, the loudest amp I've ever heard in my life. Like, and he was, he kind of <laughs> solos through everything. Like, he wasn't playing any of the, the, the and all I could hear. So I was like, well, 
like a, I trying to lock into the bass player. I mean, it was thrilling to be there, but I, I was trying to find something that would just, you know, uh, fit in with on that tune. But it was, it was kind of a funny moment because because those his guitar amps are are screaming. Great yeah, stuff. yeah. Mm-hmm. ears ringing a little bit after that, huh? Oh, there's a ring right now, so it's just... <laughs> still. I don't, I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. Yeah. And uh, and you you worked with Dan Navarro also, right? I, I I didn't see what you worked with him on, but what what did you work with Dan on? I, I, well, I, talked produced, to... I produced his first solo record, and uh, I'm playing with him next on next Tuesday. I, we have a long relationship. When I first came to L.A., a mutual friend introduced us. He said, "Well, forget the hotel. Why don't you come stay at my house?" He didn't know me from Adam. It's a funny story. So he says. Uh, my little cousin has a band and and uh and they've got all this record company interest. We should go see him. And I you know, I've heard that I was like, Yeah, sure they have, sure they have record companies. So we go I we go down to some back in the eighties in, in, in LA, they would have clubs that were just a club for a night, like they'd rent a where there were fucking lines, like a thousand people in limousines and what is going on? It was it was Jane's addiction, his cousin's Dave Navarro. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Oh, wow. <laughs> sure enough, and you know what? They were fantastic. Like it was <laughs> the energy was it was it was it was a pretty funny thing because I I'm like, what's going on here? But so I've known Dan since since the, the '80s, and we've done a lot together. But I got to, I produced his his first solo record, which was we had a great time doing that. That's cool. And you said you're planning to show with him next week, next Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that's that's cool yeah i had him on like last year or something it was a good chat we talked about dave a little bit too uh, um, we always every year we do a birthday sh- his birthday show at mccabe's that's coming up in june so yeah nice okay um wadi i want to talk to you about keith richards um so you you had a band with keith richards and uh tell me kind of about how that how that came about um uh, keith and the expensive winos and and what was it like just like i mean living with I mean, just with keith like what was that experience like for you <laughs> uh precious very precious it came about um <clears throat> i met him when i was on the road with linda uh, in the mid seventies, we met and we got along really well right away. And so every once in a while, if he'd come to LA, I'd see him and just get together and you know, sit around, hang out, play a little bit maybe, but just talk and get to know each other. And then all of a sudden, one day I got a phone call from some lawyer, uh, English lawyer. I say, oh, what are you, is this Waddy Wachtel? I went, yeah. And he goes, uh, I, I'm, I'm calling for Keith Richards. Uh, he's trying to find you. I said, oh, really? I said, well, you found me. Why don't you tell him where I am? And he goes, huh, very funny. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, I went, oops, all right, take it easy with the wisecracks. So he goes, yeah, he's at Larrabee Studio. Do you know where that is? I went, yeah, sure, of course. He goes, would you give him a call over there, would you? I said, sure. So I called him, they were doing Hail, Hail, Rock and Roll, the Chuck Berry movie, uh, mixing, mixing it. And so I called over and Keith just got on the phone. He goes, Wads, hey, man, listen, I'm putting a band together and you're in it. And he I didn't went, even meet you beforehand. He just was like, you're in it. Huh? What? No, we've met. Oh, uh, okay. okay. That's what I'm saying. We've, we've known each okay. other. For, for, got it. Okay. Yeah. Over a decade, you know, and whenever... If Stones were working in the city, you know, I was on the on the road with Stevie or with someone, I'd be at their studio hanging. You know, we we all knew each other. I I met Mick, Woody, and Keith all in that one year of when I was with one of the years I was with Linda. So we've known each other a long time, and I would spend a bunch of time with them in the studios, just listening to them do working on new records and things like that. And whenever we whenever we were in the same city, we would we would see each other usually. So. All of a sudden, that was the message. That was it. He says, I'm putting the band together and you're in it. You're the other guitar player. I went, well, that's fantastic. I'm ready. <laughs> and it was Steve and Keith were together there. He says, where are, where are you? Can you come by? So I, came, I went by the studio and met Taylor Hackford and Helen Mirren. And uh, we all gave each other some big hugs. And that was uh, the first Winos meeting, really. 
And then I went to New York uh, to hear some of the tunes. And, and it was great because I said, I don't need to bring, I said, I guess you might have a spare guitar or two. I don't have to bring it. Yeah, I think I got you covered. Said, okay, fine. So I go there and it was just the three of us and Steve and Keith and I at a little studio. And I, on, he goes, yeah, I brought that for you. And I open it up and it's a, what they used to call a TV model, Les Paul. Double cutaway, yellow thing. And I went, wow. That's the first guitar I owned. The first electric guitar I've owned was that one right there. I, I wound up giving mine to Leslie West because uh, I'd had it for so long. <laughs> By the time Leslie and I were part in company because I was moving to L.A., I just gave him the guitar. I told my father I sold it to him, but I just gave it to him. And but that was the guitar. I opened this case and there's, you know, my guitar again. I went, OK, well, that's going to work. <laughs> and uh what are we doing? And so he, the first song they played for me was Take It So Hard. And I was in heaven. I said, well, okay, I know what to do on this song and uh, I'm ready. And so we played it a few times and then uh, played Struggle. And Struggle wasn't all as finished yet. And th there were other pieces and stuff. And we, we had an amazing night. And then, then I met Charlie Drayton. It's funny because I met Charlie Drayton when he was literally a child because his dad was a very busy a jingle composer and was in the studios all the time and I was doing a album project in New York and there was this little kid playing on Rick Murata's drums I went who's that what's this kid who's that that's Charlie Drayton I went oh really and so that was Steve and Charlie were brothers beyond belief so he, he said Charlie's the right bass player for the band and then Ivan Neville was the other piece until the other piece, the one more piece that had to be added was Bobby Keys. So it's an extraordinary cast of characters. And uh, the cutting of the record was amazing. We went to Montreal to do his first record. And it was just mind blowing. I mean, we lived in this house together. It was, it was insane. You know, I mean, even sure. just to say it, right? Like that you're, uh, like, you're living, just to say it, right? Like that you were living in a house of Keith Richards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. You know, I went to bed and there's like music playing downstairs, like fucking loud as can be. I'm going, oh, this is great. Uh, okay. Finally, it's, it, it, finally, you went to bed and and I, I remember waking up the next morning and I was just down in the kitchen going, uh, uh, and I heard. I heard ice cubes hitting a glass and I went, you ain't serious, are you? He goes, you want a drink? Mm -hmm. Whiskey, whiskey. <laughs> no, I don't want to drink. <laughs> okay, you want to say they, uh, Morgan? <laughs> it was amazing. You know, Ivan Neville living in the house, you know, sharing, sharing a room basically almost and Charlie and Steve sharing another wing of the place. And then, this great, the great Don Smith was our engineer and who was just magic on the, on the board. And we just would play and play. We would, we went out there that, uh, there was a song we did that filled up, you know, back then it was 16 track tape or 24 track. I think it was 16, even. but we were playing this song and it was not like working on songs in LA where, you know, you go in, you get an idea of what you're doing and you go for takes on that song. We played this one song for I don't know how long. I mean, it was Stone style, you know, it just didn't stop. I mean, he had to change reels in the middle of it. <clears throat> he had to put up a new reel and pick it up from where we left off. It was unbelievable. It was like a whole different process. You know, these guys have created so much music in the studio. We're used to walking into the studio with music already created and doing versions of it where they would you know come up with shit in the in the room it was very different yeah, yeah. Uh, and and you played shows right like you played shows of i mean to tour tour yeah. too right yeah. we did a tour we did we toured here we toured europe no no we it was for real it was great and the shows were incredible i mean that that band live scare you to death you know 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, I must say, was one of the, the biggest immediate family fan in the world. I mean, when we played at the Iridium, he was there for the whole show. And they and they had told me before we went on, I said, look, we're going to have to leave early because we got to be at uh, my daughter is doing this DJ thing. We promised we'd be there. I said, I understand. I was just so glad you guys came. They were there through the very last note. They didn't leave at all. And it was great. And, uh, so playing with him is just an honor and a pleasure and and a learning experience. And we were in the studio at one point and, and I was, you know, getting to know, I know him outside of the studio, but I didn't know him in the studio yet. And and everyone else left the, the room and he's out there and he's like just holding this guitar and he's going, flipping the toggle switch back and forth, you know, and playing a chord or two flipping the switch and finally i just i'm just watching him i was i was just kind of observing and i finally went what are you doing <laughs> what are you doing and he goes yeah i just stand out which is i'm trying to determine which is my sound and you know i said oh yeah so why don't you ask me i know what your sound is <laughs> it's that one it's that that humbucker pickup at the neck that's your sound he goes yeah i said yeah that's it so uh and then take it so hard. <clears throat> we did two songs the first night. One of them was called How I Wish, which is a great tune. And and the second and we got it quickly. I don't know. It wasn't I don't think it was a first take, but it was it, it might have been. But um, when we did Take It So Hard and on Take It So Hard, it's Charlie playing drums and Steve playing bass and take one is the record. I mean, not the vocal, but the track, the take one, it was amazing. I mean, it was so good. And the song, the song melodically went a whole different way than when it came out. Um, but after we spent another day or two in the studio, the word was Keith wanted to recut, take it so hard. Yeah. Went, really? Okay, whatever, if he wants, whatever he wants to do, fine with me. And Charlie was going, what do you mean he wants to cut it again? What? I said, look, it's Keith Richards, man. He wants to recut it. Let's recut you it. Don't, you don't ask why, right? You're just like, okay, sure, we're doing it. Yeah. I said, I don't think we're going to beat that one. And he probably doesn't think so either. But so what? Do it again. So we went to do it again. We couldn't do it. <laughs> it was, it just was not happening. It was just it was falling to falling apart everywhere wasn't right so take one was the one <laughs> had to go with take one no take one <laughs> that's the one yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh well let's talk about the new album uh, skin in the game um so uh tell me uh coming after the self-titled album what was your idea to kind of take to take into this album what did you have leftover songs from uh, the self-titled album that you wanted to bring into this or did you start fresh where where did this come from combination of, of, of both we yeah. Yeah. did a lot of writing we all brought stuff in there's this old stuff that got resurrected um you know there's no i don't think you know at least i don't go into it like here's the concept it's just we're all song guys we all yeah, uh, song after song after song you know <laughs> and you, you, you know we just went in with what we had we've been writing for the new record and we, Steve and Danny and I collaborated on several pieces. And, but Danny had some pieces he'd written himself, myself included the same way. And like the last song, the record High Maintenance Girlfriend, yes. had that song for a while, but we chose not to put it on the first record and uh, saved it for this one. You know, that was an intentional yes. do. But uh, everything else came along, you know. You know, you keep writing. Mm -hmm. You keep writing there were some pieces <clears throat> that existed as other songs and wind up becoming a mash of three different points of view and works out great you know yeah yeah i think i think making a record for us is similar to to, to what it is when we play which is is it it's a strangely or i guess it's not that strange we've all done this a long time and known each other but it's very organic it, it, it just sort of rolls along and and why you'll send a tune and we'll Danny like holy shit that's fucking great let's we're going to do that one for sure and and i have an idea that, that 
I, we took a song that I'd written in the late eighties and we rewrote it because it had a good wow. idea and a good groove and um, it was very, yeah, very organic process. And, and we, the one thing I think the three of us felt was we wanted to, I think the first record was a little bit more just sort of the five of us sound a little bit more like what we'd be on stage. And I think we wanted to do a little bit more production, not overproduced, but you know, what does this really look at each song as a piece of work and what does it need? Does it need a, a keyboard part? Does it need a... Yeah, we actually touched keyboards on this record, you know. We didn't, you know, everything, the last record was <laughs> guitar, 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 bass, drums. And uh, we might have snuck a chord in too, maybe, but we actually tried to, you know, make more of a production on some of this, some of the material. And some of the stuff on it is straight ahead live as it should be, but nobody wants you as a conglomerate mess of stuff. And uh, looking away, we're, we're trying to go for, see how big we could make it, things like that. Yeah. yeah. Where did the idea to bring the keyboard in come from? Um, like whose idea was that? Just all of us. I mean, it's just, let's, let's produce the record. We all produce a lot of music. Let's, let's not hold back. If we hear something, it's all about, well, oh, what this would make whatever it is. It could be a loop. It could be a sound. Why, yeah. why do you have some crazy sound he put in? I forget what that's a, they said that, that hits it a certain, whatever will make the song sound better. Yeah. That's, well, that's what, like on, uh, on skin of the game, you know, we, we played the track and the track is really good. And all, we're sitting there listening to it. And all of a sudden I went, wow, you know, a piano would be really good going da da da, just like that. You know, so that's on the record, you know, things like that. They, you know, you're listening to when you're in a studio and you're hearing stuff back like no one else is ever going to hear it because you've got these huge speakers and great sound and the luxury of being able to sit there and ingest it all it suggests to you what's what's done or what isn't and what's missing or perhaps this would work maybe we should try this you know or that percussion part isn't right or let's try that you know things suggest themselves as you're listening and working on a piece of music thank goodness yeah and and when you're uh, when you're writing it when you're putting it together do you th uh, how much thought do you give to uh, to playing it live or, or do you just kind of really be in the moment and focus on making the music right uh, when you when you're doing it i, I i'll speak for me why do you could, i i could care less what we're going to do i want, again it's let's make this song great we'll figure out how to play it live yeah. you know that's we, we know we can do that so it's just about yeah the, I, we all i think we all love the recording process as well we, you know we've all spent as much time on stage as we have in studios so it's a cool it's it's another part of the way you make music and and i don't and we all know how to play you know we've played a we played an acoustic show in japan i mean we you know we can make a song sound good it doesn't have to sound like a record the record yeah how was japan how was that great i love it yeah they were wonderful they really dig us there and uh and it's it's a crazy magical place to be it's wonderful yeah yeah you did a, a tour of the west coast i think last year and uh and i i'm kicking myself because i wish i'd been able to make it uh but i had a conflict and i i, I just couldn't do it but i just I, your music is so great and i tell, tell me about how that tour went for you last year what, what did we do last year <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know <laughs> was i there <laughs> <laughs> we played libero we played oh yeah yeah it was it's all look it's always it's just a really fun, it's a fun thing to do you know yeah, we went to aspen right we went to aspen we played libero it's always a, a thrill when we play together in the studio or on stage and on stage is where it all really comes together you know the studio i always i always thought that making records was the see all do all of, of the record business and the music business but it's not the live show is the, what it's all about and as a matter of fact Crosby told me that when shortly after we met he said that to me one night I went really wow that's interesting but uh he's right that's where it comes down to that's what it comes down to I should say that's the whole deal is people coming to see you perform these great songs 
that you've written or have recorded, you know, and that's, that's the deal. You know, yeah. like, like like talking about Chains Addiction, you know, people going to, you know, lining up to see this thing that was on a record, but you want to see it happen live. Yeah, that, that's a good example. I mean, I've heard their records. I've never heard a note on the record that was as powerful as that before right. they signed, seen them in that in that in that warehouse was incredible the energy but yeah i think i think one of the things that's that's great for me with this band is that i mean obviously we're all different but i think that our aesthetics are very closely aligned like you know that for all of us there's nothing like being on stage with guys you love playing with and playing your music there's just nothing like it and i love record making records but but it that's that's like what he said it, it, that's the bottom line you know yeah yeah and uh and i mean the album is such i mean it's such a great just rock and roll album and i feel like you don't hear a lot of th that these days anymore that i mean that i mean people always say okay is rock dead or is rock and roll dying i mean but it's like you you're still making great music and uh, and you're doing it with people that you love and care about and that that are your family and i mean that's what's important at the end of the day right yeah 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 that's great yeah. Really glad you like really glad you're yeah. you're liking the record too by the way thank you uh, oh abs absolutely like again i i wish i'd seen you guys and i hope you guys are come you know i, I know steve you're going to be here and i'm going to try and catch you in that one uh but uh i hope you guys come uh, as the immediate family back to the bay and give me another chance to see you live so <laughs> good okay i'll hold you to it so <laughs> well steve Waddy, thank you for taking the time today i, I appreciate it and Bye. uh uh, good luck with the you know everything that you have because I know you don't slow down you don't stop and you keep making great music and you're I mean you're, you're legends so thank thank you so much for letting me into your world a little bit to hear some of your amazing stories I haven't stopped smiling the whole time so <laughs> <laughs> thank you Steve it's good to see you again man thanks very thanks much for chat. <laughs> you have a good one okay that was my interview with the immediate family here on concert pipeline and that takes us to the final segment on the program the music news <laughs> A couple stories to wind out the program today, uh, mostly centering around Coachella a, a little bit, um, but uh, I'll share one other story before I get into some Coachella stuff. Paul McCartney and the Eagles uh, played the Beatles' Let It Be at a Jimmy Buffett tribute show, um, and that was at Hollywood Bowl, um, and Jimmy Buffett died at the age of 76 last September after a four-year battle with skin cancer, but he uh, he left his mark uh, on, on the world, of course. The title was called, uh, the concert was called Keep the Party Going, a tribute to Jimmy Buffet. Uh, Jimmy Buffet? Oh my gosh, I tell you, the Benadryl is still kicking on me. Uh, Jimmy Buffett. <laughs> uh, and it included appearances from Cheryl Crow, ben, Brandy Carlisle, Zach Brown, John Bon Jovi, uh, the Coral uh, Reefer Band. Um, Dave Grohl introduced McCartney to the stage. Uh, and uh, McCartney spoke about his relationship with Buffett. I had the pleasure of knowing Jimmy, and like everyone else on the bill tonight, uh, said, uh, this is one great man. There were so many people that weren't even mentioned in that, that list, I mean, that were on stage. There's a video online of it panning from left to right of uh, everybody who's on stage at this uh, Jimmy Buffett tribute show. I mean, it even included like Will Arnett and other people who aren't even musicians. There's so many people who are just on stage uh, paying tribute. Um, so Paul McCartney said he was generous. He's funny, and he just uh, he's done done just about everything in his life. I was on holiday with him, and I forgot to bring my guitar, so he had his own guitar strung left-handed for me. And then next time I saw him, he'd had one custom uh, made left-handed for me. Uh, Paul McCartney took to the piano, performed Let It Be, backed by the Eagles. Uh, there's footage, of course, of that. Um, and uh, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in the works as well as how to, for how to recognize him. Um, but, uh, but you can check all of that out. Uh, so let's talk about Coachella just for a moment. Uh, Coachella is the first weekend of Coachella has happened this weekend. And then there's weekend two next, uh, next weekend. Um, I'll say... 
I don't know most of the bands that are on the Coachella bill at this point. I don't know if I've aged out or what, but or it's just not my genre, but I feel like I should know more. But uh, there were a couple of bands I was excited about. And so I did watch some of the performances last night um, that, uh, that happened, including Bleachers, uh, Jack Antonoff's band, apparently Taylor Swift and her uh, boyfriend, uh, Travis, were in the crowd just to watch. Not to, uh, Taylor did not perform, although there were rumors that Taylor was going to uh, perform. Uh, she was there to support her friend, though. She's really good friends with Jack Antonoff, and he's produced a number of her albums. Um, and the Bleacher set was good. I, I, I did like it, but I don't care about a lot of the newer songs that he's had. I love the band. Uh, he only played a couple of songs that I care about. What was interesting was that his guitar uh, wasn't working for uh, for part of the set. Like he just, his guitar kept, kept taking the guitar from him, taking it back, uh, testing it, bringing it back out to him, taking it back, testing it, bringing it back out to and it and it wasn't working. Um, I think there were some other major issues with Coachella also. Lana Del Rey's uh, mic kept cutting out. Uh, I heard there were other artists that were affected by this as well during the uh, Coachella. So, uh, so not sure what was going on, but there were some. Uh, Uh, but he brought out Childish Gambino, a.k.a. Donald Glover. Um, and uh, I mean, which was interesting because I thought Childish Gambino would, was like retired from make, making music. But uh, but hey, he, he came out uh, and he uh, performed Running Out of Time from Tyler's 2019 album, uh, Igor, Igor. Um, I don't know. Uh, Glover appeared while the stage is dark, wearing a bucket hat and an oversized cardigan. Um, and... That and they played, uh, they played some music, and uh, then ASAP Rocky came out for the live debut view of Potato Salad, followed by Who Dat Boy. Um, and uh, and so there's some good cameos there. Uh, and No Doubt, No Doubt was the big one that I was like, okay, I gotta see that. Uh, because uh, I used to be such a big fan of No Doubt back in the day. I saw them, seen them live a number of times. Uh, Gwen pointed me out of the crowd at one show where they opened for U2 uh, during the simple kind of life, uh, during the line, you'd make a good dad. Uh, and uh, I don't know, it was, that was, I, I was like, my life was made at that point, right? Uh, such a performer, such an amazing band. Um, and 2015, they just put, the, put it up and never really played again. Uh, after that. And so this is a bigger surgence for them. Um, don't think there's any word as to whether there will be any other shows, but I'll tell you after watching last night, if they, if they say they are going to do a tour, I'm there. Like it was just great. And it's like, they hadn't missed a beat. They played all the hits and, and great, great songs. They did a couple covers, um, you know, as well. Olivia Rodrigo joined no doubt for a surprise performance of Bathwater. Um, and, uh, uh, on the second night, let's see, this marks both Rodrigo's and her dad's first time performing at the festival. Uh, for the eighth song of their set, they, I welcomed Rodrigo to the stage as a special guest. Stefani and Rodrigo traded verses on the single with Rodrigo sporting a tank top that read, I love ND. The crowd ate it up uh, and the pair hugged at the end of their rendition before exiting the stage together and Glenn came back in a wardrobe change after, uh, after that. Um, uh, Gwen's ability to evolve and explore different styles of music, songwriting, and aesthetic while still remaining true to herself is incredibly inspiring, Rodrigo said. To me, she's a prime example of an artist who uh, defies stereotypes and preconceived boundaries and just makes stuff that she thinks is cool. If that's not a true artist, I don't know what is. Um, but, uh, uh, but I mean, that's, that was just a cool surprise um, for, her, for them to bring out uh, Olivia. I was wondering if there would be any su surprise guests during the set, and there was. Um, Gwen Stefani shares regrets over last the last years of No Doubt, saying, I should have just been with my family. Um, and uh, the band, uh, say, uh, let's see here, they played their first set, but in a recent interview with Nylon, uh, she opened up about her regrets about how the band's original run ended. She described feel uh, feeling like she had nothing left in her while working on the group's final album, 2012's Push and Shove. So 
Stefani was married to Gavin Rosdale at the time. Uh, and she now says she wished she'd stay home more with her three kids, Kingston, Zuma, and Apollo. Uh, I would be leaving my family. Uh, and if I didn't come home with a song, I'd be like, oh my God, I'm such a loser. I didn't have dinner with my family and I didn't write a, uh, a song. I wasted an entire day of my life trying to be in No Doubt Again. Uh, uh, I look at it now and thank God, why was, what was I doing trying to please everybody? Because really, I should have just been with my family, but we did it. And there are some, uh, some good songs. Um, the band, the band have no events scheduled for after the festival second weekend, although Stefani said earlier this week that she was open to anything, despite there being no concrete plans for touring or new music. Uh, she said, well, I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, most things have uh, surprised me in life. One of the things I've learned to, is to be present in the moment and try and absorb what's happening around me instead of looking ahead. Um, uh, and uh, she's saying it just happened so fast and that's my favorite kind of thing to happen. Uh, and she was surprised to see how the internet blew up with how excited everyone was. Yeah, they were freaking awesome. No doubt was great. I was standing behind that. And I just always love seeing them live when I, whenever I got a chance to see them. Uh, and, uh, and this was just like a trip down memory lane. I mean, she did uh, Just a Girl and, uh, and did the push-ups during that song, which I always remember her doing uh, when they played that song live. Uh, she, uh, uh, she, on the stage, so did the rest of the band. They looked great. Tony, uh, uh, Adrian, Tom, they were all on point and seemed to be having a great time. They all kind of, they came out from below the stage along with uh, Adrian's drum riser when the, uh, when the set started and they were started the show together in this tight group on the stage, you know, with less than 10 feet between them all. They'd run around the catwalk of the stage and uh, at different points. And at the end of the set, uh, Gwen uh, and then took a bow together, of course, but Gwen uh, climbed on Tony's back and uh, he rode her off into the, uh, uh, the sunset, so to speak, yeah, in the backstage. Just keep being young and playful and, uh, and having fun, and enjoying those relationships that went by the wayside when no doubt um, disbanded back by 2015. So really great set. Um, uh, I think they're playing next weekend too, so maybe I'll check them out again. Uh, but I, it just it scratched an itch. It was that I didn't know really was missing. I mean, I did see the you know I missed the chance to see them in 2015 when they played Bottle Rock, uh, one of their last shows uh, uh, that that they did, and I had passes, I had press passes and everything, but I missed it for a chance to. I mean, because my my buddy wasn't up to it, and uh, and instead we hung out and. I prepared for an interview for my job, uh, which was in the long run was way more valuable than seeing No Doubt again. I did hear them from my house at that last show, though. Like I could hear them a couple miles away at my house and I was listening intently out my window and, uh, and missed it. But, but I missed those days. It's just a nostalgia piece. Um, so excited to get hit some more nostalgia next weekend when I see Ben Queller. Uh, maybe I'll pull some of that in, uh, into an episode, uh, some of my footage into an episode. Uh, we will see. Um, that's our show for today. And uh, next week on the program, we have an interview with T-Bear. I got to catch up with T-Bear and uh, we dug deep. We dug deep. It was a long interview. We'll get into that next week. But uh, good stuff ahead for Concert Pipeline. For all of us here at Concert Pipeline, that's our show. We'll catch you next time. 